Hello and welcome to part one in Purdue MEP's first uh, additive manufacturing webinars. My name is Kyle Squillis and I'll be your host today. Here's a little bit about me and my background as a manufacturing and quality engineer in the private sector for a production manufacturer. I have some CNC milling, programming, and machine operating background. So I like making things. And then additive manufacturing came along and I was hooked. I was an operator and trained uh, fellow employees on the various technologies most familiar with uh, fused deposition modeling or FDM, uh, polyjet, and SLS or selective laser centering. I also had a lot of hands-on experience in the model shop finishing and preparing uh, SLA, stereolithography parts. Our job shop focused on rapid prototyping and model building for designers and engineers. What I want to talk to you today is, is not only that, but where additive manufacturing is going. And with that, just a little bit of terminology uh, clarification here. A lot of times we'll refer to 3D printing and additive manufacturing interchangeably. I like to refer to additive manufacturing as 3D printing for production applications or at larger volumes. Uh, so with that in mind, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about Purdue MEP and what we do. Uh, on the engineering and technical side, we have our technical assistance program, 40 hours of faculty time from Purdue University uh, for approved projects uh, once a year uh, for any Indiana manufacturer that has a specific need that may be outside of a normal um, the, the normal scope of what MEP uh, industry advisors could provide. Uh, we have access to faculty and researchers who are working very specific uh, technologies and materials that, that might be a, a perfect fit for what our clients are looking for. Uh, cobots are a really hot um, product for for not only us but for manufacturers in our Struggles region with labor and trying to find qualified people or people just willing to to put the time in on a um, it, it could be a mundane uh, you know repetitive job cobots have proven to be a great tool um, for manufacturers to utilize uh, across several different applications in manufacturing and we're doing these site evaluations uh, at no cost along with our partners Allied Automation, who I'll, t I'll talk about uh, here shortly. Cybersecurity is another big one, especially for those who are doing defense work. Uh, there is a, a mandate coming down the pike from uh, the, the DOD where firms must be qualified and uh, have certain measures in place when it comes to cybersecurity threats, uh, and that is coming in 2020. Uh, so it's coming up, and, and we're helping get firms you know, compliant. And then with additive, you know, Purdue MEP is, is starting to offer public workshops uh, where we can show you multiple technologies uh, on site at once um, in, in such areas as a makerspace or a, a university lab. Uh, so this is unique. So it's, it's not a high pressure sales situation like you normally might be exposed to when you're looking at these printers. Uh, we want to show you the pluses and minuses of each and some sample parts and materials and how they differ from one another. And then site evaluations it kind of goes along with, you know, evaluating the best fit, um, the best fit technology within additive for a specific manufacturer or supply chain. So that's where we'll come in, walk the shop floor, walk the warehouse, look at some sample parts, um, see where it makes sense for you to either onboard a machine or start with outsourcing and get familiar with uh, a certain material or a certain process that you can then later uh, bring in house once you hit that level of comfort that you need uh, to make that to make that leap. Uh, so this is a typically a half day commitment uh, for a fee. And for more information, you can go to our site uh, mep.purdue.edu, uh, and you will be able to find out more information about the uh, added manufacturing assessments. Going back to cobots here, they work alongside humans, which makes them unique from industrial robots that typically have to be caged. They're very expensive. Um, while they do move a lot of mass and they move quickly, uh, cobots are kind of the opposite. They're a, a much much more lighter duty. 
uh, and speeds that are safe to work alongside, you know, coworkers and, and not, you know, cause a safety concern. Great for dull, dangerous, dirty tasks, and that's that's really been, uh, you know, the key in, in finding applications that are a good fit for these for these cobots. Allied Automation has been around for decades here in the Midwest. They have a strong presence and strong engineering team, and, and that's really uh, what, what really helps to set them apart. And they offer multiple solutions, thousands of products within automation, and Universal Robots has been their fastest growing product in 40 plus years of being in business. Uh, so that just is a testament to how popular and uh, successful the cobots have been you know, at these clients. Okay, so let's get into it. Uh, a lot of people think about 3D printing who are coming in from the outside and just think, well, it's similar to document printing, you know, just pushing a button, and it is not that simple. Uh, the goal is for it to be that simple at some point, and in, in some cases, rare, though that they may be, that can be achieved, but it, it's it's rare that you're going to start at that point. Uh, so there are a lot of considerations, and and, and things to keep in mind when you're trying to 3D print something. Uh, just because you can 3D print something doesn't mean you should 3D print it, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So part orientation is probably number one. You know, X, Y, and Z, X being left to right, Y being front to back, Z being up and down within the build chamber. Z is usually going to be your, more, your most accurate uh, orientation. Um, but it's also going to add time, so you got to think about that when you're setting up a build. Uh, build optimization, especially when you get into technologies such as powder bed fusion, build optimization is huge as far as packing in parts as densely as possible uh, without compromising part quality, uh, surface finish, or part integrity. Build settings such as infill, Resolution, you know, temperature settings. If it's a, if it's a temperature-related technology, those are all important when it comes into setting up the build. Once you've got the CAD file created, material properties. It's huge. Plastics and metals all behave differently, and the printer acts differently when it's you know depositing material. Um, depending on uh, whether it's a polymer, a ceramic, a metal, uh, you have to be very familiar with the material behaviors. Internal structures and features, complex geometry isn't necessarily a problem with 3D printing, but you've got to uh, get to think about how you might be able to lightweight a part, for instance. You know, walls don't have to be solid anymore because you're building from the inside out, potentially. And so things that normally aren't achievable are with additives. So lattice features, you know, complex internal structures, Cooling channels when it comes to you know, injection molding features. Cooling channels can be designed not with machine limitation in mind, as you normally would, but optimized for part performance and cycle time reduction. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of exciting things going on there when it comes to internal, uh, internal geometries. And what's your machine capable of? You know, how fast can it go? What's its temperature setting? If it's a nozzle, you know, can it get hot enough to, you know, to melt the high temperature plastic? You know, are you, have you are you matching materials with the printer properly? Are you pushing one too far so that it's it's going to give you a poor result? And then desired result, you know, are, is this the first prototype? Is this a production part or something in between? You're going to treat those differently as far as the build settings go. You know, fast to slow. Material choice, material strength, part strength as far as how many layers of thickness the wall has, the wall structure, you know, the, those, all, those all depend on, uh, you know, what your final goal is. And so um, it's not a one-size-fits-all uh, consideration. Look at the 3D printing process overview here, kind of five steps starting with the CAD-based 3D model. This could be unique and, and designed in a CAD program. It could be a file that you download from a free or paid site. Uh, it's, a, it's a growing category every day. There are thousands of more files that are available just like there are you know, um, uh, novels available at your library, similar uh, when it comes to the library of 3D data that's out there. Whether you start uniquely or with an existing part, though, you need an STL file or an equivalent of, such as a 
uh, OBJ file, for instance, or a, a CMF um, where there's color being involved um, with as far as the data. Uh, once that STL file has been created, you're then going to send that over to the printer and you're going to slice it through, through lines of code. And that's usually done in layers. And uh, just like your CNC mill or lathe might interpret G code, uh, this is where that happens on the 3D printing level. Um, so again, this is all automated. And, you know, you don't have to be a programmer to do this. This is all built in the slicing software. The, the knowledge that's required is between steps two and three. So the orientation, the build settings, the material chosen, the speed of the printer head, that's all done between steps two and three. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit here in a future slide. Four would be the build, uh, the build of the part itself. And then five would be post-processing or end part finishing. So we're gone from one to two, right? So we've got our file. Now what? The slicing software. So these are usually uh, a part of the package that you buy the printer. They come with the printer, uh, but not always. There are some universal slicers as well that are out there and some slicers that are compatible with multiple mas machines, such as Ultimaker's Cura software, which is, which is a great one. So let's take a look and see what this looks like. So basically you pull the part onto a bed here and you've got some some settings over to the right where you're looking at um, oh, he's going to add the printer first but then you got some settings you're going to look at infill hollow 0% 20% 100% gradual which is a, a calculation that the software can do where you're putting material just where you need it kind of optimizing it um, you can see here the material is chosen as uh, pet g uh, and the profile is a high quality, meaning this is going to take longer versus a low quality, which would be faster. So that's kind of the give and take on the profile. They're going to import a file here. We're going to see the part drop onto the digital build platform here, but that's fully representative of what the, the 3D printer bed looks like uh, in real life. So, so you can see it automatically places it uh, pretty simple. Um, and this is the CAD file. It's been turned into an STL file in this case. So this is the STL file we're looking at. And what's important to note here is that if you're doing multiple iterations of a CAD file, um, you don't have to change the CAD file that many times. You can you can scale the STL file up and down. You can orient it differently depending on how you want your build. If you learn something off of the first attempt, you want to re reprint it. Uh, you don't need to create multiple CAD files and bog down your CAD library in that case. You, you can just create that on the slicing software and iterate from there. Uh, so it, it doesn't create a massive amount of data on your system. So you can see you're able to rotate, move, um, scale up and down, I mentioned. Um, take a look at the part from different angles, X, Y, and Z. Here's the origin here. So those are those actions that he's talking about there to the left on that panel. So it's more about, you know, you don't really, you don't get to do much with the design of the part. For the most part, if you want to change the design, that, that should be done in CAD. But if you want to change just the scale factor from like one to two, uh, if you want to rotate the part around, if you want to copy the part, that can all be done in here. Those are all functions you can do within uh, the slicing software. Mary's sh shrinking this up and down. Uh, if you want to change the design of the part, though, you should get out of here, get, get back into your CAD package and uh, generate a new STL based on those changes. All right, so we're going to hop out of here. So we've sliced. Now we're, we sent it off to the printer. And this is where the uh, machine is going to interpret that code and go to work. So let's check out the four primary 95 plus percent of uh, the uh, utilization around the world. So. Uh, first one being uh, the Pioneer, which was SLA or you know, stereolithography, or the whole category now is known as photopolymerization. So you see the word photo in there. So again, this is light-based resin that uh, is hit by a laser in a vat, hardened and, uh, uh, and built again layer by layer in plastic or wax typically. And this was the first technology developed in the late 80s. Um, that became the, the stereolithography machines um, that started the whole 3D printing wave. Next would be material jetting uh, or binder jet uh, technology. Uh, you can see this is, covers ceramic, metal, plastic, wax, and sand. 
Um, this is a, a unique uh, technology because it um, it is similar to 2D printing in some aspects. You're talking about no tiny, tiny nozzles dispensing uh, material uh, across a moving head, similar to how a printer head lays down ink uh, on a piece of paper. The difference being that the, pr the piece of paper is now moving down, uh, and that's your Z or third dimension uh, creating that th 3D part. Material jetting typically, real high resolution, various uh, results when it comes to material integrity. Um, some are brittle, some are fairly strong uh, when you get into some metals. Uh, and then you've got a unique application like sand where you, you've, you've turned uh, the foundry industry upside down um, because you, you're able to create these quickly and cost effectively create these one off molds in sand um, that, that are really game changing in low volume uh, metal casting uh, applications. Powder bed fusion is, is unique because this is the one that really promises to get a lot of folks into the production game. It's usually a bed of powder being um, polymer as far as nylon or steel, titanium, very common, uh, where you're relying on heat to uh, heat from a, a laser generally. Um, electron beam is another one, but generally it's a laser. Uh, comes across and outlines uh, the profile of the part layer by layer. A recoder comes along and pushes more material in, and before you know it, a part appears out of the bed. With key difference between metal and powder here, so this is this is important to know. Two key differences: the metal technology DMLS typically needs support for parts that come out of this bed of powder, whereas the polymer such as nylon does not. So you're just packing parts in tightly with no support considerations. You're still thinking about orientation heavily, but uh, you're not dealing with the, the support structures, whereas in metal you usually are. So you need a post-process like wire EDM or CNC milling or bandsaw to take care of those supports. And then the other thing is it's the metal is a cold bed, cold being relative, but it's a uh, it's relying on the laser at 1,000 C or, or higher to, to center metal together, metal powder together, whereas the polymer, uh, it's, it's heating the bed to just below melting point of the powder, and then the laser is coming in and heating, heating it and centering it above to harden and create a part. And then the, the post-processing is unique because it's a bit like an archaeological dig when you talk about finding the, plat the, the nylon parts in this block of powder. And then deposition is the most highly adopted technology and the one that people are probably most familiar with or that w were introduced with. So it's, think of it as a glue gun on a uh, CNC controlled gantry um, to, to simplify it, but that's really what it is. You're melting plastic through a nozzle and, and, and laying down continuous bead. Stereolithography relies on, you know, like I mentioned, laser or UV light uh, to locally harden that vat of liquid. So you're you're preloading a machine with a lot of resin. Uh, there are some desktop units now that, that help with that, but it used to be cost prohibitive when it comes to loading up a machine of, of uh, expensive resin. That's come down in recent years, and the price of material has come down a lot, uh, so it's been more utilized. And uh, it's always been accurate and always been smooth, and uh, the materials have gotten a lot better recently, especially as far as the, the brittleness. They're much more durable and, and high-performing compared to where they were in the early years. But some of those resins that will be mimicked include polypropylene, ABS, polycarbonate. Um, but there's, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, development going on with ceramics and uh, you know, these hybrid materials that kind of combine the best of both when it comes to maybe durability and uh, heat deflection. Uh, so this is an exciting, exciting area, especially when it comes to material development. The technology hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, the speeds have gotten better, certainly. Material jetting, we, you can see the, the icons there. They've got some, some droplets being dispensed out of the ink head. And it, it, again, it's really high resolution and accuracy. Great for models, great for you know, mid-stage prototypes and models where you want to see details. You don't want to be distracted by a lot of layer lines or inconsistencies. Uh, this is, a, a, again, a light-based technology that the UV light is curing the resin in real time as it hits layer by layer of the part. 
uh, and this is a this is mostly acrylic based. Great examples of clear parts you can do transparent, translucent parts that that can come off of these printers. So this is a, a good application for those that are in um, you know think about lenses or anything where glass or acrylic is traditionally used. Uh, material jetting should be considered for sure. Powder bed fusion. Um, the acronyms under this category would be multi jet fusion, which is which is basically a Hewlett Packard HP's division, their technology. It's producing similar parts to SLS, which is kind of the pioneer selective laser sintering. Um, but uh, it's been, it's got a system where it's coming across in not just a specific laser point, but, but an entire, uh, hitting an entire layer at once instead of just an outline. So the speed is much better, and they're still getting better results when it comes to isotropic behavior, meaning the strength of a part in X, Y, Z direction. Z has usually been the weak point, and they're they're getting closer to uh, like an 80% isotropic strength in Z, whereas before that's been well under you know 50% in SLS and some other technologies. So multi-jet fusion is really coming on strong. Nylons, TPUs, so thermoplastic urethanes, flexible materials, and metals. I'm going to show you an example. Uh, you can see the profile. It's changing uh, each layer by layer. It's progressing. One of the things to consider is sharp or drastic transitions. Uh, you want gradual transitions, 40 degrees or less generally, or else you're going to get a lot of stress concentrations that can uh, uh, negatively affect the part performance. So things like chamfers and radii and transitional areas that uh, that don't go from one large flat piece to a skinny piece, for example, uh, you want to you want to break that down into uh, multiple steps if possible. So you can see the outlines. You can see the result here, where this is a this is a metal part, and you can see the the support on the bottom, what the inner walls look like. So those supports on the bottom will be shaved off on a bandsaw or uh, a wire EDM or mill, and then you're going to be left with the metal part. Uh, so that's a great example there of what that metal machine looks like. And that's, sorry, to, I should have mentioned that, but that is not in real time. That is time lapse that has been sped up considerably. And then fused filament. Fused deposition modeling is what Stratus has coined this technology as. And uh, you're working with thermoplastic polymers. That's the benefit, real-world plastics, ABS, PC ABS, HIPS. PETG, nylon, all commonly used in this technology. Uh, it's usually the entry point. So these machines are sometimes just a few hundred dollars if you're building a kit or an open source system yourself. Uh, but they can go up to you know several hundred thousand as an industrial DM machine. Um, this is the largest installed base of printers by far, and it's a it's a great option for a lot of early stage prototypes, but also some functional parts. And uh, we'll get into more examples here as we go. I'll show you this quick video as well, just so you um, are very clear on what we're looking at here. All right, so this is another time lapse, but you can see the inner structure. It's not solid. It's a, it's a unique organic lattice structure in that inner wall um, and how that printer is, is building up. It's, this is also not showing you the movement of the head just for ease of use in, um, in this video. But uh, you can see how complex this shape is, and you also might notice there's no support structure, and that's that's not an accident. They chose this part because it could be self-supporting. So you can see these angles are all would look to be um, you know less than 40 degrees, so that uh, you don't have any overhangs that aren't going to fall and collapse due to gravity. Uh, the previous layer is is in, uh, underneath the next layer enough so that it will support Venus flytrap type of uh, the uh, part here uh, is kind of organic and unique as it is. More of it, uh, as much of anything, it's to show you that the internal wall areas, pause it here, you know, can be achieved through no other process besides additive. So, you know, you could not do this any other way, getting these unique, you know, organic lattice structures. Okay, so we've printed a part, and now we're going down to the end part finishing talk about some of those techniques here. We've got manual and automated. Pretty straightforward, you're familiar with all of these. The automated techniques are interesting because you can tumble parts, so drop in a batch of parts uh, as a lot instead of uh, one by one. 
You can media blast as a lot as well, or even have a conveyor do the blasting so that it is very much uh, automated or a lot less hands-on. Um, because finishing is a big deal in, in additive. You know, labor, you want to try to minimize it, of course. It's how many touches uh, an operator is, is putting on a part. Uh, but at the same time, you need a production-looking part, so you need that you need that finish, but you don't want to spend you know a ton of time on it. So that's where some of these automated hybrid finishing systems come in, where you can drop parts in and it will do a combination of things, maybe chemically, maybe vibratory, maybe even um, support removal that the operator would do. So progress is being made in this area as well, not just the machines and the materials, but on the post-processing side to get additive into a production environment because that's what it's going to need to take. Um, you know, we can't have operators sanding parts one by one and expect them to cost the same as, you know, parts that are injection molded and coming off every five seconds. So uh, we've, we've got to think about these things as well. And that'll be, that'll be further topic, future webinars and workshops. We'll talk about, you know, part, part finishing applications. Okay. So what are we looking for here? When I look at a part, how do I know if it's a good candidate? Generally speaking, existing profiles such as pipe, uh, sheet metal, uniform wall thickness uh, or standard size wall thickness of, of uh, sheet plastic or metal that can be formed or you know, vacuum formed, pressure formed, you know, formed in a press break, those are usually going to be more effective in the traditional manufacturing method. Now, if you need one or two and you don't have any tooling available and you're in a crunch, yeah, maybe it's 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 okay to 3D print it, but you, you've got to consider some things. So holes are not necessarily going to come out as true as they would. 3D printing, actually, it, it's it's not intuitive as far as, you know, the simple shapes are not always the simplest to make. Like holes and flat areas can be the most difficult to get very flat and very true as far as the whole concentricity or, or uh, accuracy. Uh, be aware that just because you can 3D print something doesn't mean you should. Things that can be turned on a lathe or easily milled, those are usually better candidates for traditional technologies. What are good fits? Well, we've talked, we've talked about internal passages and lattice structures, so we'll cut this part in half. You can see kind of the airfoil type of um, wall profile here. Uh, that can only be done in additive. You know, you're lightweighting a part, so you're removing a ton of weight and, and still giving it the strength that it needs. Prototypes, of course, is where, where this all started, but it's not just parts. You can use prototype molds can be printed, um, tooling, uh, such as, you know, even press break tooling that you're only going to be doing, you know, a, a, a low, a relatively low number of parts, you know, that can be done in plastic or a composite. Um, so it's not just the end part. It could be a hybrid manufacturing where you're using a mold or a tool. Components that normally you'd have to weld or rivet or fasten together, well, combine them and, and print them all together additively, and you're going to save that labor and that failure rate, have fewer warranty claims. Again, anything needed quickly, great candidate for 3D printing. Geometries that are using topology optimization and generative design. This is relatively new. Um, so software, so we talked about post-processing coming along. Well, software is coming along a ton as well, and it's figuring out that Complexity isn't a big issue with 3D printing and additives, so let's just take some inputs that matter and then let the software dictate the design a bit. So you can see the part on the right is what the traditional fabrication uh, was done. It was, looks like it's formed, maybe some holes punched, some weld lines. Well, then you ran it through the uh, the algorithm to do the uh, Jenner design, and you can see how different it looks. And it, you know, the, what's key here is that it's it's much lighter weight, it's much more th additive friendly, meaning uh, a lot less materials being used. And uh, while it looks complex, you know, it's it's a better candidate for a successful build uh, versus the part on the right um, because of the added material and, and, and heat stresses that can be put into the part. Um, but it still may perform just as well or at the, you know, at the tolerance level that's acceptable compared to the part on the right. So that's what we talk about when we, we look at topology optimization and generative design. Uh, you're using software as your main tool to come up with these unique unique shapes that you could not make any other way uh, with traditional manufacturing. Life cycle adoption. So where did we start? Well, we started in prototyping, right? Well, and then the material got better. Uh, automation and software improved. 
Uh, so we thought, hey, we can make some spare parts, and then maybe we can get into beta testing even. Um, you know, the cost is getting better. We can we can print 20 or 50 or maybe even 100 parts versus, you know, having an aluminum mold uh, milled and waiting weeks and paying tens of thousands of dollars. You know, it's possible to print these pilot production runs versus uh, tooling up and, and waiting and taking that risk. But then we want to get to end use parts, right? We want to get to production. So that's where things are really starting to get exciting uh, in the additive world. Okay, where else can we apply this though? We've got production floor needs as far as visual aids, fixtures and tools, robot end of arm tooling. Uh, I mentioned cobots before. You could 3D print a custom profile finger or gripper suitable for just your part where it's going to really engage uh, and hold that part securely. Quality department, printing gauges and fixtures, they don't need to be made out of tool steel or you know, metal for that regard. They just need to be rigid and accurate, be repeatable. So why not print them? Why not use them uh, and get them running in a matter of hours instead of bogging down your tool room and waiting on, you know, getting on, in that backlog, uh, you know, waiting on your machinist to make those fixtures. Go ahead and print it. Uh, and if it, if it fails once, so what? Print another one. You know, you're still going to beat the, the time and the cost for waiting on one in steel coming from your tool room. Go no go gauges. You can print text. You can print color or add color to parts. You know to really make it visually stand out and visually appealing for the for the operator. Supply chain. Okay, so traditional fulfillment. We, it kind of looks like this. You know, we've got at the warehouse waiting for orders. It's got a bunch of parts, millions of parts in it, right? Or product. Orders taken. Orders picked. So you've got a couple of touch points there. Is the order put in right? Is the order picked correctly? Is the order packed correctly, picked up on time, shipped without damage? You know, there's shipping costs along with costs for that operator all along the way, and then it finally hits the customer. Okay, can, maybe can we can do a little bit better than that, though. So let's look at what does digital fulfillment look like. Well, you've got the customer there represented by that computer monitor and tower ordering a part and, you know, can just have access to a library of parts, and they found their specific model number that matches up to their lawnmower, let's say, and they want to order it. They have it printed in a matter of days and uh, sent out directly off the printer with minimal post-processing, no warehousing. The order is picked, I guess. You could make an argument for that, but, uh, you know, several steps are eliminated in this instance. And what if you know, the printer is even close to the customer locally or even at their house. Then you've got no shipping involved and no, you've eliminated another touch point, another cost. So this is already being done on a, on a much smaller scale, but it's just going to keep growing and growing as we find more applications for these. It's a great supply chain tool, Additive is, because you're, you, don't have to, you don't have to inventory the tool and maintain the tool and run a minimum order. So the customer experience is much better because they don't have to order excess parts that they don't need or pay, you know, undue costs because, you know, the supplier's got to account for the warehousing costs and the operator costs and the tooling costs. All that goes out the window and, and you're just looking at what is of value to the customer and that's the end, end part or end product. And so that's what we're really hitting at here with Additive is getting closer to that end customer. Running on demand, reducing your warehousing, Reducing your lead time. Lead time is huge. You know, you know, a lot of shops are busy these days, and you think spare parts are at the top of their list. You know, probably not. You know, they're going to want to ship high value product and parts. So, take take ownership yourself. You know, you know, invest in additive so that your network or your your facility can can keep up with warranty claims and spare part demand. You know, through additive and, and not maintaining any any really significant tooling investment. Customization is big. So. Uh, Mini Cooper just just announced a program where they're they're allowing customers to add their name or custom text to a dash panel that's 3D printed. You know, and that's you know that's a niche market, but it just shows you you know what can be achieved through additive, and and that's just not something that you could do with traditional manufacturing and have it be feasible or cost effective. And and you and people will pay for customization, so drive your profit margin up. You know, why not reduce the overall cost? You know, this is something you're going to have to communicate. With those purchasing folks, uh, I'm sorry, I apologize if you're listening. I'm going to badmouth you here a little bit, but it is more than just the piece price, right? And sometimes those folks, you know, they can't see past that. But if you talk about the overall cost of things, you know, a lot of times you can make a good case for for additive because of the bigger picture. I mentioned it, tooling, warehousing, 
you know, touch points, lead time, warranties, you know, all that should be factored in when you're thinking about whether a part should be made traditionally or in-house or additively or outside, outside your manufacturing facility. So just to wrap up here, what are we, what are we looking at? You know, it's not a fad. Additive is here to stay. So stay on top of it as much as you can or talk to us at Purdue MEP. We're here to help you uh, stay up to date. Uh, keep track of what your competition is doing, but it's not a fit for every application. It's another tool in the toolbox. It's arguably the best tool in the toolbox, but it's it's not going to replace a lot of these traditional manufacturing methods, despite what you may or may not have heard in the media. Um, that's been a uh, that's been a constant battle with trying to educate people and tell them what's really achievable. But you know, features, speeds, materials, it's always improving. It's still a growing category. Uh, metal is really coming on strong. It is behind plastic, but it is coming on strong, and that's really where a lot of it, uh, a lot of inroads are going to be made in the next, you know, five years or so. I, I predict it's just going to explode and get into so many new markets. Designing for additive is key, though. If you're if you're doing your own design uh, or even retrofitting a design for additive, it's rare that you can just plug in the traditional CAD geometry and and, and go successfully with additive. So. That's where you know you've got to have experts looking at your parts, your needs, uh, the application, and, and make sure that while the part may look differently being built additively, it still has the strength and durability and whatever other metrics you need it once it comes off that that 3D printer. So um, it opens up new opportunities and business models. So there's always new cases being made. You know, there's the headlines tomorrow in the paper. You know, any of these. Uh, added to pu publications that you read, that they usually like to find some some interesting uh, case studies. One I, re I read recently was a 3D printed cell phone case that you know it, they don't have any tooling. It's just all done with additive manufacturing in nylon, and uh, that's how they're shipping products directly on Amazon. And they they really have taken off with that. So um, so stay on top of it. But there's there's a lot to decipher and to uncover, and that's what we're here for. If you're interested, reach out to our team. Reach out to your local economic development group. Uh, we're looking for those folks as well, partnering with them to bring in, bring in public workshops, uh, lunch and learns, where you may not just be your company, but others are interested in your area. Happy to come in for a few hours, feed you, show you what a specific application looks like, such as production aids, QC, supply chain, just really going further into those things and show you some case studies and what, what can work for your company. We'll be doing some hands-on workshops, so showing you the printers live, multiple technologies in one room, which is very rare, and we're not selling you machines. We're selling you solutions, and we want to make sure you're prepared because it's an investment. It's not a, it's not a document printer. It's going, to take some, it's going to take some getting used to. There's going to be a learning curve, and that's what we're here for. Feel free to contact us. Bob Goosen's email listed there below. And if we have any questions, I would like to take those. If not... Thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. Uh, I know these webinars can get long. I try to try to add some new information. Hopefully, you haven't seen before, or if you have, just reiterate some of the the important things that are going on with additive. Uh, check out our workshop schedule. Subscribe to the newsletter. It's only monthly. There's a lot of good content in there. We won't spam you. We promise. Uh, but again, thanks for your time. Uh, I look forward to working with you guys, and uh, have a great one.